now. That, that's a, this is a word that is used in the Greek, and it's used for more purposes than one. It can be an adjective, but many times it has to do with time. And we're going to analyze where it is utilized in the Scripture today on time, and at the same time, we're going to look at our world, our earth, what's happening here. And we're going to see what our Father has to say about it. Now, to when the word nun, the Greek word now, is utilized in that strength, it means look around it. Who is it addressed to? What's it talking about? What's going to be happening at that time? And then you will understand the time reference, but not until. Okay. Do you understand what I mean? You have to know rightly dividing the word, what's being discussed, and when that time comes, that's it. That's now, nun, in the Greek tongue. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. Many times when we see a great deal of consternation in this world, if you study just a little bit, Father has told you that it would come to pass a long time ago. You, you need not be caught short. If you stay in the Word, you're well informed. And man only fears the unknown. Once you know, nothing. Fear, you're afraid of nothing. Okay? You men can be more like some women I know. Okay? That's, I'm teasing, okay? in a way. <laughs> in a way. Now, I'm, uh, women of Israel, quite frankly, I'm going to sidetrack just a little bit. You know, in the old times, they went to war with the men. I don't mean warring with the men, but helping them against the enemy. Okay? They were good at it. Man. Anyway, uh, but our Father, in this Word, informs us. That's why the war word can change lives. Man can't. You know, you can talk to somebody all day long, and they'll probably still be of the same opinion. But if you can find it in the Word, God touches. That song was appropriate. He touched me. And He can make a difference. Oh, can He make a difference. Okay, Romans chapter 8, pick it up with verse 16. Let's pick it up here, and we'll pick up the Word that we're looking for here. And it reads, The Spirit itself, that's the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So who are we talking to here about the children of God? Are you one or are you not? Well, children of God pretty well go with God's Word, and if you don't do that, you're not a child of God. You're a child of somebody else, and that's not good. Verse 17, and if children, if, if you be a child of God, then heirs, you know what that means you inherit, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that means jointly feeling the pain of the lost, those that need help, those in the world that really need a lifting up and lost souls that you can feel that pain. because The Spirit is talking to you when you feel that, when you try to have that unction to have. That we may be as also glorified together. In other words, you suffer together, you're going to be glorified together. If not, guess what? He doesn't want anything to do with you. You're an outcast. That's not good. You've got to obey the Father and do it His way if you want His blessings. Otherwise, you're a shamble, a fake. And that's not good. It's so much better to witness to His Spirit, His sweet Spirit, and hang to it. Okay. Do you know something? That's how you find peace of mind. And when you've got peace of mind, no man can take that away from you. Regardless of what, it's yours. It's yours given by the Father, uh, that Spirit giving unction to you, that you're His child, a child of God. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You cannot imagine how wonderful it will be to be out of these flesh bodies and present with Him if you make it. You know, a lot of people are not going to make it. They're not going to be able to experience that. It's kind of sad, isn't it? But you get what you deserve. But to, you cannot imagine or reckon how wonderful it is. Do you understand the creation itself longs for this? You know, when, when the catabol, when the first destruction came along, do you know what happened? The firmament was above us that protected us. There were no hurricanes. There were no storms. This is why you can find uh, palm trees in the middle of the desert, high in a mountain in New Mexico and Arizona, uh, petrified palm trees in the desert. Why? It wasn't a desert then. It was beautiful. It was lush. And the mammoth and the dinosaur roam that lush lagoons of the desert. Why? Because the firmament was above us. There was no jet stream, and the earth wasn't 90, degree, uh, 90 miles off true north to magnetic north. It was wonderful. Everything in its place. That's why that we have remains of mammoth with buttercups in their mouth from uh, the tundra of Alaska. Buttercups don't grow in Alaska. They did then. It's a wonderful place. And God, because He was upset with the children that went astray, brought down that firmament. And that's why you see canyons and washes and destruction. And then he brought us in as children of God if you choose to decide to follow him. Or hey, you can follow Satan the liar if you want. That's up to you. I don't know what your soul worth. Nothing or something. That's your choice. You know, you know nobody else does. But you know what your value is. And I hope it is as a child of God, one that loves him because he has, you don't know what he has prepared for you. Um, verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature, translated creation, okay, of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The very earth itself, you know, we talk about global warming and we talk about this and that. Hey, the, we pollute this old earth. Don't worry, it's still, there'll be hot and there'll be cold. God has promised that. It'll always be there. He's the one that controls it, not man. Okay. So, but even the earth itself waits for the manifestation. That means when the sons of God come into their inheritance. That was the subject. Okay. Verse 20. I'm sorry. We, yeah, verse 20. For the creation was made subject to vanity. God created it that way. He used it. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. In other words, he's got a plan. It's a beautiful plan, and all you have to do is follow it. And verse, um, verse 21. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's going to happen. It's going to be go back to its... Pre, uh, Future, the, our, its past beauty before the catabol, before the overthrow. Many might say, well, is that written in the Bible? It sure is. God tells you in Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 18, my children are just a little bit sottish. That means stupid, okay? Just a little bit stupid as to what has happened. If you don't think I destroyed this earth before, you keep up doing what you're doing and I'll do it again. Will he do that? No. But he gave that warning, and he told exactly how he destroyed it. It wasn't pretty okay, in Jeremiah chapter 4. But there it waits with God's children. That's why God's children are so special to our Father, those that love Him. I don't care what your position is in life. If you love Him, you're perfect. Okay. 
in his eyes. He loves you. He returns that love. That's what he wants from you. Verse 22, for we know, did it say we're guessing? No, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. It's labor pains. It's time for the birth of a new age, and it's going to happen. But even nature itself wants that that's right, okay? It strives for it. It reaches for it. Just like you see a little old flower that you cut away from the sun a little bit, it'll lean toward it. It'll stretch for it, okay? Just like you should when you stretch for the truth, to hear the Word of God and to please Him. And not only they, I'm sorry, I want to back up, together until now. That word now is S-N-U-N. In noon. That means when? Well, when this happens. Well, let's hang on just a little further. We're, this is in relationship to the children of God, the sons of God, which there's no gender in that. That's daughters included. We're talking about God's elect. When the elect come forth, this now applies. Got it? Do you understand what that means? That means now in, as far as this generation is concerned. We'll document it further here in a moment. But there you have in verse 22, noon, which is to say now. It groans, it waits for now. You know, whenever you see the Spirit and you walk out into the wilderness, even at this time, and listen and feel, even nature itself wants to go back to that beautiful setting. We can't even imagine. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That is to say, for the end to come. Okay? When this transpires. When is it? Now. This generation, the generation of the fig tree. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? In other words, the reason God truly, really loves you is you still love Him, and you haven't seen all these wonderful things come to pass. That is to say, the first earth age, the beauty of it. You didn't see that, and you have to take His word that He's promising it in the future. And you have that hope that you love him enough that you have faith to believe. Boy, that makes his day. It truly does. He gives you his word. He keeps it. But we hope for that we see not that then do we with patience wait for it. That's hard for some people to do. Okay. But you got to let know God's in control. He knows what he's doing, and sometimes we don't exactly know 100% what he's up to and what has to be done. Why? He has millions of souls that he must deal with. And we're here in the business of saving souls. Because why? Because we suffer with Christ to see that it happens, that that salvation is made available at least for those that would choose doing something worthwhile instead of fluffing off, serving God, loving God, and being blessed of God. 26, likewise, do you know what? Likewise, the Spirit also keepeth our, helpeth our infirmities. That's our weaknesses. Do you know? He knows your weakness, and if you're with Him, He'll help you. If you're not, guess what? Forget it. Suffer. Okay? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He takes care of those that love Him and follow Him and that really try. You can count on it. Otherwise, count yourself out. Okay, period. It's just that simple. Why, why am I saying that? Because it's so important that you do love Him, that you do follow Him, that you do please Him. Do you know something? He's your father. Do you know how to get along with the father? 
Well, he's got feelings. And he's full of love. You can hurt him. I mean, you can hurt him real bad. And those feelings are so easily tilted, but at the same time, so easy to please him. He knows you're not perfect, and that's what repentance is about, okay? But he helps. What he's saying is, you don't even know what to pray for sometimes. He intercedes when you're in his walk, okay? He'll tell us that in right here, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Do you know who the saints are? This is important. It goes all the way back to 22, the now. It's the saints. What, what does that word saint mean? The set-aside ones. What are the set-aside ones? God's elect. Those that he predestined. Those that he knew, those that at that first rebellion, that first overthrow of the creation, they still stood with God against Satan. Why did God choose them? Because they got it. They stood against Satan then, and he doesn't have to worry about them standing against him now. He can count on them. Can he count on you? That's the question. Can he count on you? Okay. Uh, uh, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called. There again, he did what? He called them. They didn't volunteer. Called according to his purpose, not theirs. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. That's election, friend. Don't ever try to take away from it. The now, the generation of the elect. Now, my friend, this season to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, cutting the path, the pioneer, showing you how it's done. That's what Christ was. That's what he did as Savior. Showed you how to get it done without a whimper. Oh, but I just have it so bad. Oh, you poor baby. Satan just loves you when you whine and groan like that. He's, boy, has he got you in his pocket. And we're going to miss you. God loves can-do type people. And that's, I mean, he showed you how to get it done. What, what, what if Christ himself had said, if you could have cross, let's just wait one more day. Can we wait just one more day? Those nails are going to hurt. Can you imagine that? No, he didn't whimper. He said, Father, thy will be done. And so it was. He cut the path. He showed you how to get it done. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, those he chose, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's how God's elect can hurt him real easy if you're not careful. You know why? He counts on you. He depends on you. He trusts you. Verse 31 to complete. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Doesn't matter. Bring it on. That's why you don't even have to worry about being a wimp. Who can be against you? Nobody, because God is for you. And you might say, well, well how do we know it's going to work? We're going to make it work. There's no ifs, no ands, no maybes. We're going to make it work, and we're going through. Why? The Word has promised it. That's the way it is, and no more need be said. Can, do, type, people. Did God forewarn us of the creation that that uh, somebody might get gored thinking it's going to overheat, overheat rather, the earth, global warming or something of that nature. Did he forewarn us of that? Of course he did. Told us a long time ago. Open, let's go to the Old Testament and check it out. Let's go to Jeremiah, one of the great prophets. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 12. Concerning this earth and, and what transpires here. 
Jeremiah chapter 12. <clears throat> Let's pick it up with verse 9. We have any musicians in the crowd? Verse 9 reads, Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. In other words, there's going to be a great feeding when God kind of brings the hammer down again, all right? There was a song written about that verse, is why I said that, okay? The great speckled bird. Verse 10, many pastors, many what? Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They took what was good and simply polluted it. Well, but brother, you don't understand. We pastors have to teach truth. And you don't have to worry about God's word. You, no, listen to me. You don't have to understand revelation. Don't you know why? You're going to be gone. What kind of person would listen to that kind of jargon? Is there a man you would listen to instead of God's word? Would you take him over God's word? I would hope not. I would hope that if someone told you you didn't have to understand God's word, you would tell them where they, in hell they had a spot. Okay. Because that's where they're going. Okay. God wants his word taught. He wants it taught chapter by chapter. And verse by verse, whereby it is God that speaks, and not some yo-yo. Okay. He says, my pastors have literally taken my word and my wilderness, that's to say the earth itself, and just trodden it down, taking away the true meaning of it. Well, let's just take God out of the vocabulary, shall we? What have you got left? Shootings, molestations. Rot, ruin, it's written, friend, and yet people don't listen, okay? Um, they have, verse 11, they have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The very earth, the whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart. They just seem to continue. They won't come back to the word of God. The spoilers are come upon the all high places through the wilderness. For the sword of the Lord shall devour from, from the one end of the land even to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. That is to say that's against him. You're going to have peace of mind because you're for him. Incidentally, you do know what the sword of the Lord is, don't you? That's you. Well, how could you say the sword of the Lord is me? Well, Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, have you ever read it? It says there is a sword that comes from Christ's mouth, and it's a two-edged sword, and it's His Word. And when you take this Word, you have the sword of the Lord, and it cuts both ways. Oh, man, does it, okay, to the ways of the world. And, well, you might offend someone. Tough stuff, okay. Truth should... Not offend anyone, and if it does, they need to get their act together. They need to come back to the Word of God and be pleasing to Him, to love Him, to follow Him, and be blessed. It's much better to be blessed than cursed. Uh, and verse 13, they have sown wheat, but they're going to reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit, and they shall be ashamed for their revenues, that's to say their harvest, when they get ready to run their combine, their harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. They're going to be ashamed of their harvest. They're not going to have anything. But then, if you follow the ways of the world and the teachings of man today, where you drive the Word of God out of our schools, out of our politics, but you must be politically correct. Well, wouldn't you rather be morally correct and have God happy with you 
than you would to harvest what we're harvesting now in a crop of misled, misguided corruption to where even the highest, some of the highest politicians of this land think nothing of just bold-faced lying right from our Senate floor. Don't think anything about it because it's what? Politics. It's a lie. You can't cover lies up with politics. Okay. You got to kind of wake up and smell the coffee because we're late along in the day. And our Father is not the least happy and we're going to reap what we sow. That's why you want to make sure you're sowing the Word of God. So that you reap the bounty blessings of His love and His, uh, his uh, blessings. 14, thus saith the Lord against all mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. God's not going to put up with this forever. You got it? 15, and it shall come to pass after that I have plucked them out, I will return. There's your when. I will return and have compassion on them, and will bring them again, every man to his heritage, and every man to his land. I don't know, what are, what are you inheriting, hell or heaven? It's up to you. It's your call, your life, you steer your ship. You know, nobody has to worry. They can look at your ship and tell you what kind of shape you're in, whether it's floating high in the water or you're about to sink. Okay, it doesn't take long. Father has promised. He's saying, the creation groans toward me. Again, you learned it from Romans 8. The manifestations of the sons of God. Their way, the earth waits for it. 16, and it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord liveth as though as they taught my people to swear by Baal. Then shall they be built in the midst of the people. Revelation 21, 20 through 24 says the nations, the ethnos come there that love the Lord. Otherwise they won't be there. Okay? Father will not put up with uh, double talk. Father will not put up with people that do not love Him, that do not follow Him, and He makes short work out of it, and praise God for that. And yet, all those that hear and love Him, I don't care what nation, I don't care what country, He brings to His bosom and loves them and gives them a home, and gives them blessings. And just as that, I'll go back to it again. Revelation 21, verse 20 he says, Who is this? Why, why are the nations coming to Jerusalem, where the Lord's throne is situated? To love Him. To worship Him. That's what they're coming for. So naturally, that's why they're blessed. And that's why God blesses them. And you know, the house of Israel covers many nations. The house of Judah also. Verse 17. But if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. The Lord doesn't put up with nonsense, and He won't do it forever. And He's keeping score. The book of life is chugging right along. Your name is there. You're in that book. And I know what's written by most of your name, that he loves you. And there's been some bad things written there, but guess what? When you repented, it's gone. Okay, It's erased. It's good news. Okay, uh, I'm glad you can't see mine. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's clear now. All right, thank God. But... See, that's the way our Father is. He loves us. And it's really quite that simple. You're either with Him 
or he's going to destroy those that would disturb this earth again. So that time is coming. And I don't think you would want anyone here that would tear down or root up or cause trouble again. You don't want to go through this again, do you? Although it's not bad, good flesh bodies, healthy, smart, intelligent, you know, you're handsome, good looking, attractive people. You know, not bad, but we got a lot better. You can't imagine. Wonderful that we look forward to that. The word now, noon, is also translated time in a few places. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Rightly dividing the word of God, <clears throat> knowing which people we're talking to and about. In Matthew 24, let's read verse 3 so we fix the time and the question that's being asked, okay? 24 verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Do you know that's a question that's asked by many, many, many people. So that's the question. That's what's being asked here. What's the sign? What's it going to be like? And he gives all seven signs in this, and I'm certainly not going to go through them in this lecture, that are the seven seals, the seven trumps, and the seven vials. But we are going to cover part of them that is a visual that you're going to see, you're going to witness. And we'll pick it up in verse 15 of Matthew 24, concerning the end and when Christ returns. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. That, that's a little print saying, you that have ears to hear, hear it. You know what he's talking about from Daniel chapter 9, 27. It's the Antichrist standing in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus. Okay. When you see that, that's a sign it's here. Okay. Now, it's also written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Don't you ever let anyone deceive you. Christ is not returning until after the Antichrist stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God. We're warned over and over. How can a child, even a child, miss it? They shouldn't. Okay. Continuing with the signs, verse 16. And let them which be in Judea, that's the, land, the state in which Jerusalem is, that's where it's going to happen, that gives you the location, the where. Flee into the mountains. 17, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. You're not going to have time. Okay. When you see this, it's over. A watchman stands on top, and you're all watchmen. Got it? Neither let him which is in the field return back to take up his clothes. You're not going to need to pack any clothes. You won't need a change of clothes. It's over. Okay. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. That means those that become spiritually, I repeat, spiritually impregnated by the false Christ. That, you know, our husband is going to be gone for 2,000 years. If he comes back and you're suckling a babe, what does that mean? You weren't true. Okay. You've been hanky pinking, okay, or something like that. I don't know. But uh, anyway, verse 20. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. No, don't be harvested out of season. Most people got enough agriculture about them that they know when the corn's ripe. Okay. You should know the Bible well enough to know when the harvest is for the Lord, too. Neither on the Sabbath day. Why? Because you could only go about half, three quarters of a mile on the Sabbath day, and that's not far enough to miss the destruction. God's going to flatten that hill, Mount Zion, and prepare it for the Millennium Temple. Verse 21, And then shall be great tribulation such as, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Noon. There's that word again. Noon. Now. Okay. Translated here, time. 
Many of you are going to have in your newer Strong's, it'll have a different word. Don't worry, the original was noon. Okay. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm going to have the Strong's reprinted again someday as soon as I can find a good printer. Back to the original. It's been tampered with, okay? The manuscript, the, the um, type. Uh, time here, noon. In other words, never before, nothing like it. When? When this happens. This generation, again, my friend, hey, you're living in perilous times. So exciting. And then some people get bored. How can they? How can you listen to the news of what's happening and relate those current events to this word and be bored? Our Father's talking, He's speaking, He's showing, He's pointing. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake. For who's, who's the people we're talking about? The nows, the time, the elect. Okay. The elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. We know they're shortened to a five-month period in Revelation 9. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or he is there, believe it not. In other words, they are coming. Did he say maybe the Antichrist is coming? No. He said that he's going to. Okay. For there shall arise false Christ. Not maybe, they will and false prophets, and shall show sign, great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Do you got that? I have told you before. He's told you before what? Exactly what would happen. It's all in the prophets. It's all in the Word of God. All you have to do is cover it, absorb it, and believe it. And you are chosen. You are God's elect. Does that make you real special? No. It just means you have eyes to see and ears to hear. You care. And you know that you're here for a purpose, not just to float through, but to serve Him, to serve our Heavenly Father. I, I want to go to one more place here. Let's go to Mark 13. This is repetition, but let's get this down good. The noon. Mark chapter 13, and you know this is the same subject, same thing practically, but I want to get the, suit, the time again so that you understand noon is also translated times. And you can check this one out in the concordance you have today. It will fly. And it will in the original Strong's work also. Okay, verse 14 of Mark 13 but when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where, translate it, he, okay, where he ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in the Judea flee to the mountains. Do you know why you can take the liberty to translate that he? The same word in the Greek is utilized, the value given because of the subject, whether it should be she, him, it or what? It's according to what is being discussed is the entity. Got it? Okay. So therefore, what's being discussed, who's standing in the holy place? The Antichrist. So it's, it's not, um, it, it is not an it. It's not a desolation. It's a desolator. It's the one. All right. And let him that is on the housetop not go into the house, neither enter therein, to take anything out of his house, and let him that is in the field not turn back again, for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Again, nursing a child of Satan. Don't let that happen, my friend. Jesus warned about this back in that 24th chapter of Matthew again, when he said, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah right before I come back. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage again with the fallen angels. So be set, friend. Be ready. Even the elect could be deceived if it were possible. It's not possible, but it's going, to be, it's going to be something to behold. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation. You got that? Nothing like it. Which God created unto this time, noon. That's now. 
right now, this season, your generation, neither shall be. And except that the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then, of course, the verses, the Antichrist, don't believe it. Down to verse 23, but take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Where did he foretell us all things? Right here. In this word, noon, now, he tells us. And you're a part of it. You're that generation. He expects great things from the election. Because there's a, there's a great battle, a controversy between Satan, the false Christ, and the true Christ. And many Christians have said, well, I just wonder what my duty is. Stick around. Boy, are you going to find out. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen in and to this generation. And there are wonderful things happen then. In closing, Revelation chapter 12 for me. Revelation chapter 12. You know what triggers all this. Let's read it in fact. And let's grab us one more noon, okay, to put yourself there, okay? Revelation chapter 12. Verse 9, let's go there. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. There he comes, okay. He was cast out into the earth. Where did he go? To the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. That, that's why that, uh, they'll be giving and taking in marriage again. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now, that's noon, the time, got it? Now. It's important, beloved. It's important to you because it's talking about you. Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of his brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Do you know something? Christ has given us power over all of our enemies, including Satan. He hadn't got a prayer. Okay. Don't ever let your heart be faint in combat, in battle. Because you are going to be right in the middle of a spiritual war. And you can cut it. Why? Because you're one of God's elect. And don't you ever, ever let anyone tell you that you can't cut it. You know why? Because when it's too deep for everybody to plow, everybody else to plow, that's just the way we like it. Okay. Why? We've got it. We got what? We have our Savior. We have Him now. And He loves us. And we love Him in return. We've got a battle coming up. And we're going to win it. Why? We've got some champions. And those champions win every time. Why? They have the blessings of Almighty God. Even the prophets wanted to live in this generation. You do. You want to thank God for it. The time of action. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the word. The sword of the Lord. Thank you for that sword, Father. And give us the ability to handle it, Father. And may we never sheath it. But keep it action ready, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. 
The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. If this is the case, what happened to Enoch and Elijah? The Bible says that God took them away in a whirlwind and they were not seen again. Second King. You're misreading John 3, 13. Okay. Everybody that ascends up had to descend down. And everybody at death ascends up. Not the flesh, but the soul. That's biblical. As it is written in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. In uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, to be as soon as this body dies, instantly you go back to the Father, the Spirit, which is to say the soul, the intellect of the soul. So um, all have gone up. Now, the difference is, the word you're looking for is transfigured. All of those were transfigured. In other words, their body went with them. Uh, Ellen from Michigan. My son was stricken with cancer. I don't, I don't know how anyone could believe any stronger than my, any more faith in the Lord than we. Uh, but even though the elders laid hands on and with oil, he was not healed. Do you think that I may be right in the thinking that sometimes the Lord calls us home maybe to save us from something worse than death? Well, uh, he's, number one, he's putting an army together up there to come down and end this. But I have believed in all my years of teaching that there are some people just too good for this world. I think God gives some people a free ride through this flesh age. Uh, that's my opinion and my thoughts. And um, sorry for your loss, but we know where he is. He's with the Father. And as I stated, Father is putting that army together. Now, Michael from Oklahoma. I've got a question for you. Why was... John the Baptist in prison, what was he in prison for? For teaching truth. He told old, he accused old Herod. He said, you, you took your brother's wife away from him and now you're trying to molest um, uh, your stepdaughter. And I mean, he told him the truth and he was thrown in prison for telling the truth. And Herod even kind of liked old John. He hated that he had done it, okay? Uh, Many of the disciples were in prison for one reason only, teaching the truth, the Word of God. What are the three world ages? Well, there are the three ages that God set aside in 2 Peter chapter 3. The first earth age naturally is past. That's why you have dinosaur remains and events from the first earth age in which Satan rebelled and a third of God's children followed him. And, re and God just destroyed that first earth age and brought this age into being and caused each child to be born of woman innocent to make his or her mind up whether they will follow Satan or Christ, our Father. Okay, And that, that's up to the child to decide which they're going to do, totally and completely. Okay, um, Those are the three earth ages. There, I have a work titled that that you can acquire if you like, or highly recommend 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, Sharon from North Carolina, I pray you can help with my question for it is on the unclean called pornography. Uh, for I was told that there is nothing wrong with it and that there was nothing in the Ten Commandments that said it was wrong so it was okay to look at. I myself feel this stuff is wrong, so can you please help? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, temp grove worship. It's the equivalent of grove worship. 
that's where the egg festivals in the spring came from. They were called fertility rites, orgies. Okay. Um, it isn't a matter of being the Ten Commandments, it's being what's, uh, it is in the Ten Commandments. You put nothing before Almighty God, you put pornography before Almighty God and you're in a heap of hurt. You're one deceived, lost, poor, miserable soul. Okay. Um, it is well when, well, I, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say it's, it's in the Bible a lot. It's called grove worship. You can check it out from there. Naturally, it's not going to go into extreme detail, but uh, in another, read the first chapter of Romans in detail. Jim from California, Pastor Murray, as a former combat Marine, you ob obviously believe in the right of self-defense, but do you see any conflict between the exercise of that right and Jesus' turn-the-other-cheek philosophy? Absolutely none whatsoever. You see, any time that a person comes to me and thinks there is... Um, a conflict in God's Word, it means you, you're not familiar with God's Word. You, you simply are not understanding it, and you need to let that settle in your mind. If you think there's a conflict in God's Word, you're not letting it settle into your mind. Now, you've got to rightly divide the Word of God. To rightly divide means who was He talking to? Who was He instructing? Who does it apply to? What was he talking about? When he said, turn the other cheek, he was teaching the disciples how to teach others the Word of God. He was not teaching a multitude. And he was saying, if you go too far in, with truth, example, if I were to walk up to some minister and say, hey, you're lying to the people about there being a rapture. You're going overboard, you're misleading them, and you're going to take them straight to hell by teaching there is a flyaway doctrine. And he reached out and slapped me, then I would have to turn the other cheek. Do you know why? Because I overloaded his donkey. It wasn't his fault, it was mine. I should use more common sense and, and be a little more gentle in persuasion. That's why in Christians you always fish for men, and you do it. Just as you would with fish, you don't go out and get a club and start clubbing fish. You hook them, okay? So, yeah, yeah, I would turn the other cheek, but at the same time, as an old combat Marine, if I walked out on the street and some bully wanted to be bullied, I'd deck him, okay? I'd work him over good if he walked up and slapped me. It'd be a sad, sad mistake, okay? Uh, so there's a, that's self-defense. So you see, there is no contradiction. It's according to how, whether or not you rightly divide the Word of God. David from Arkansas. Pastor Murray, thank you for your teaching. You are welcome. In Luke chapter 5, verse 35, is Jesus talking about his crucifixion. May God bless your church. Well, he sure does. And yes, he was talking about the time that he would be taken away. But he wasn't literally taken away. His spirit is still with us. Uh, Donna from California. Uh, once a demon is cast out and returns to the kingdom where God will deal with it, can that demon come back to earth again to possess a body that is void of the Holy Spirit? You know, that's kind of God's business, but it is my understanding he destroys them or puts them back in chains for that day, okay? You want to remember, there are no demons per se. Okay. The word always in the manuscripts is evil spirit. That spirit belongs to some person. Example, you have a spirit and I have a spirit. Each of us has our own spirit. And many times when someone has passed away and they are an evil person, such as even the fallen angel, their spirit can traverse this earth. Okay, Just like you can, with your spirit, persuade someone to accept Christ or maybe do something bad. Okay. It's according to what the spirit does. But each of those evil spirits belong to somebody. 
And that judgment we must leave with the Father. Do you understand? Uh, you mentioned that it wouldn't be a bad idea to have things to trade with when the Antichrist comes. Are you referring to things like 10 cents, 25 cents, uh, 5 cents, and silver dollar? Well, 5 cents wouldn't do you any good because it's nickel. The only reason you would save 10 or 25 is because it's pure silver. Pewter wouldn't do you any good. That's not, it's got to be precious metal. Okay. Now, it, it isn't necessary to have to have that sort of thing. God's going to take care of his own. But it is intelligent to have something to barter with so you don't have to depend on Satan's money. Okay. That's just common sense. Um, and don't someone go getting all carried away and put most of your liquidity in precious metals. It's not a, necessarily a good investment. Would be right now if you'd done it a long time ago. It's going out of sight. But anyway, be that as it may, I, I, don't, I don't give financial advice. Just a little bit, okay, to trade with. Question, will those who are pitched in the lake of fire be kept alive in torment forever, or will they eventually burn up? Their time is in the fire determined by the, their sins here on earth. You know, a lot of people worry about well, that lake of fire. God, God doesn't torture people, okay? Uh, they are, he kills the soul, blots it out, and that, that's eternal punishment. If I turn this piece of paper to ashes, how long is it for? Ever and ever. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's letter to you. And that, that letter is His love to you. Return that love to Him. You know what? It makes His day. And when you make His day, He's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, and um, when you bless God, He will always bless you. Most important, though, this that you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word, even with trouble, still a good day. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.